We are really excited tonight to engage you in a conversation about the critical need to preserve our humanity and how we might be able to do that given that we are careening at light speed into the digital age. We're thrilled to be partnering again with the Institute for Cross-Disciplinary Engagement, or ICE, the good ICE, at Dartmouth College. This is part of their series of very rich dialogues between a scientist and a humanist, organized by Marcelo Gleiser, the director of ICE, and Amy Flockton, the assistant director. Marcelo Gleiser is a theoretical physicist and a cosmologist and a leading proponent of the belief that science, philosophy, and spirituality are complementary expressions of humanity's need to embrace mystery and the unknown. He and his work were bestowed a huge honor last week when it was announced that Marcella was the winner of the 2019 Templeton Prize, which is an award honoring an individual who has made an exceptional contribution to affirming life's spiritual dimension, whether through insight, discovery, or practical works. Since it was established in 1972 by the Templeton Foundation in the UK, the award has recognized Nobel Peace Prize laureates, dissident intellectuals, and spiritual luminaries like the Dalai Lama, Mother Teresa, and Bishop Desmond Tutu, and now Marcelo Gleiser. So please join me in giving very hearty congratulations and a warm welcome to Dr. Marcelo Gleiser. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I think we are up for an amazing night. Uh, we have two spectacular speakers here, and the topic couldn't be more timely, right? I mean, we are all immersed into this world where digital technology is sort of uh, serving us, but also controlling us in somewhat scary ways. And we are going to talk about that a lot tonight. But before we do that, I have a few sort of more practical things to ask you. First of all, you must have sat on a piece of paper. Um, that piece of paper is a survey that our funders ask us to have filled up so we have more money to do this again and again and again. And in fact, with, with the Museum of Science, I hope, right? So please take one, it'll take you 30 seconds to fill it up and it's super important because they want some kind of quantitative data of what people feel like when we do these events, these public dialogues as we call them. Um, the other thing is the rundown of the evening. So the way it's gonna work is first, we're gonna have, when I'm done speaking, I'm gonna have a 90 second video about the Institute. So you're gonna see me awkwardly on the screen over there talking about this stuff, but still, so you understand what we're doing and why we're doing, which is the most important part. And then um, I'm gonna invite our, our speakers. They'll each have about 15 minutes to talk. And then the three of us will engage in hopefully a spirited conversation about the important topics of the night. And then we're gonna to open to Q&A for you to ask questions. And Lisa and James will be running around with, hopefully not too fast, but you'll be running around with microphones so that you can speak and be heard, okay, for a, for a while. And we're gonna wrap it up. We can't be 8.30 anymore, Lisa, because we're late. So you have to give us a few more minutes, but still, uh, around 8.30 or so, okay? All right, so um, if you could roll the movie, please. The world is a complex place, a network of flowing information and changing patterns where forces known and unknown generate the most sublime beauty and the most terrifying destruction. The world inspires wonder and doubt, and we humans try to make sense of it all, creating stories, theories, symphonies, and poems. I am Marcelo Gleiser, director of the Institute for Cross-Disciplinary Engagement at Dartmouth, or ICE. On behalf of all of us at ICE and our partners, I invite you to be a part of our institute, to be a part of this very essential conversation. What is the nature of reality? What is the future of humanity? Will machines think? 
will and should we become immortal? Is there free will? Are we alone in the universe? Can science be a path towards spirituality? ICE was created to address these issues and establish new bridges between different ways of knowing. Our mission is to overcome old bigotries and facilitate a constructive dialogue between intellectuals and the general public, creating a community of citizens concerned with the common good, engaging experts, promoting public dialogue, and offering open access courses. One thing is certain, the hardest questions ask for different viewpoints, for a cross-disciplinary approach, for intellectual openness. The sciences and the humanities need one another now more than ever, and we need them both. So, I'll now introduce our speakers. So I'll start with Jaron. So Jaron Lanier, you know, is uh, is being considered uh, by Wired magazine as one of the 25 most influential people in technology in the last 25 years. So 25 on 25. He is a real Renaissance uh, man. He is a computer scientist, he's a composer, he's an artist, he's a writer that uh, addresses many, many topics from high technology in business and to social impact of technology, philosophy of consciousness and information, internet politics, and the future of humanism. I don't know, maybe some of you were here when we did our past event where we talked about transhumanism uh, in the spring. No, the fall last year, I guess. I can't even remember when it was. Jaron's second book, Who Owns, Who Owns the Future, is a critical and insightful perspective on big data. Who owns the data, what it all means for our society, and the quest for a sustainable digital economy. Jaron looks at the large patterns shaping the digital world, such as the 2008 financial crisis, the NSA surveillance, and the implementation of healthcare.gov, who Owns the Future remains an international bestseller and was declared the most important book of 2013 by Joan Nasser in the New York Times and was on the Amazon 2013 Best Books of the Year list. It has also been awarded Harvard's 2014 Goldsmith Book Prize. The impact of Who Owns the Future was celebrated prominently in Europe when Jaron was awarded the 2014 Peace Prize of the German book trade, one of the highest literary honors of the world. And of course, he published last year the book, 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now, which is going to be certainly some of the topics that he's going to discuss. And our other speaker is Sue Halpern. She is a scholar in residence at Middlebury College, sorry, a longtime contributor to the New York Review of Books, and now a staff writer at The New Yorker. Halpern is a author of seven books of fiction and nonfiction, most recently, Summer Hours at the Robbers Library. In addition to the New York Review, Halpern has written on science, technology, and social issues for the New York Times and Rolling Stone and many other publications. She's the director of the Millbury Fellowship in Narrative Journalism and a recipient of the Guggenheim and Equine Green Fellowships. She has a doctorate from Oxford University. So now please help me welcome our speakers for tonight. And we're going to start with Jaron. Hello, hello. Uh, and you would be the audience who needs no introduction. Uh, well, I want to share a thought I've been playing with. I'm not sure if it's correct, but I will share it with you. And if it starts to feel worthwhile, it'll go into a book. So you can help me think about it. So it starts with a story that's rather chilling to my blood, and uh, it took place not far from here in Hartford, Connecticut. Last year, there was a contest where bright high school students around Connecticut competed to be able to ask questions of a few figures, including me, who were considered to be worth talking to. And so they competed in small groups. And I was in a theater in Hartford, and I met with the top team. And they collectively decided the first question that they wanted to ask me was this. If AI is going to surpass us, if we'll have no jobs, if we won't be needed, why did our parents have us? Why are we here? 
Now, I, I guess the first thing that flowed through my mind is I love talking to teenagers, and every time I talk to teenagers, I'm prepared for all kinds of garbage coming out of their mouths. <laughs> I'm prepared for weird, underhanded, very brilliant insults that put me in my place. I'm prepared for cynical stuff and depression. I'm prepared for massive confusion. I'm prepared for pent-up rage. I'm prepared for experiments with unfortunate identities that will soon pass. I'm prepared for all of that. I've never heard this before in decades. I think this is new. And I, um, I'll tell you what I tried to assemble in my head to tell them, although I don't know if I did a good enough job in it. Um, here's what I said. Um, there's this way we talk about technology that has as its origins not rigorous philosophical debate, not intuitive sensibilities, not cultural tradition, but rather raw marketing and fundraising. Now, uh, this started very close geographically to where we are right now. It started at MIT. Um, I was there very young, and my mentor was the most wonderful mentor to me, the most brilliant and sweet man who I bet some people in this audience knew named Marvin Minsky. Anybody know Marvin? So I can't express how much I adore Marvin and how much he meant to me. But the favorite thing that Marvin and I did together was argue. And from when I was a teen, I would tell him, but this AI stuff is just a ridiculous way of thinking computers. And we'd have this great argument. And he'd always say, wow, it's so nice to have a, you know, a kid who doesn't just agree with me. But when it came time to go to DARPA for funding, he'd say, OK, now it's time to play along. <laughs> now we agree. And the thing is, you show up at the funding agency and you say, we're building this giant brain that'll surpass people. And if you're not on board with it, some other giant brain will belong to the communists or whatever. And like, they're like, oh my god, oh my god, here, make the giant brain. And so that is approximately the same thing that Google's doing to the institutional investors now on Facebook. It's approximately the same thing we're all doing to make these spectacular market caps for the big tech companies. Uh, and I'll own my part of it at Microsoft. We do it too. And it's an incredible story. Uh, you know, if you're really making God, like, who's going to talk back to you? And if you can kind of prove it, if you can kind of say, hey, my algorithm's running everything. We're running politics. We're running dating. We're running your damn rides around town. We're, we're, it's it. Whoever has the biggest computer runs everything. Buy in or be left out. But does that really tell us what the right way is to think about computers? So I've had this feeling for a really long time since, and I should, I'll tell you another story. When The last time I saw Marvin when he was frail before he passed away recently, I was um, walking to his house in Brookline with, a, with another old student of his, and uh, I was never formally a student of his. I, was, uh, I, wor I worked for him as a researcher, as a, as a kid. But um, a, a student of his was saying, you know, Marvin's very frail. Don't argue with him. Don't do the old AI argument. And I showed up, and Marvin smiled, and he said, can we argue? <laughs> and like, we did. And he, it was so great. It was so great. So um, let me present the position that I would take with Marvin to present this counter perspective. And it goes like this. There are qualities we perceive in humans, in ourselves and in others, that we really have never succeeded in defining well. Uh, these include the sense of consciousness, the sense of free will, the sense of self-awareness. All of these things we talk about them. We have to make decisions about them, sometimes life and death decisions in, uh, in medicine. Uh, we some, uh, but, but do we really know what these things are? And if we're honest with ourselves, we don't. We, we do not have a consensus, rigorous definition of any of these things. And um, therefore, 
to talk about any, and, and by the way, here I'll say something, I, I hope that that's not a controversial statement. Um, there are some who would think it's controversial because they don't even think we should use the terms if we can't define them. Their consciousness isn't a thing. There is no self-awareness. There's just determinism. It's an illusion. But then I say, what's having the illusion? <laughs> you know, like illusion is the one thing that isn't reduced if it's an illusion, right? It's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's, it's a, uh, exceptional object. Um, so, uh, <laughs> We, when we talk about anything related to these in, in machines, and even intelligence, I think we can talk about an idea of intelligence in people, but we don't really know. We have this correlation of different test results that we call intelligence, and I think it has some utility. It was created by people with good intentions, but I, I mean, I've had students who didn't test well as being intelligent, who then made fantastic contributions, so I mean, and we all have. So. We know that that's not rigorous. We know that that's not a final understanding of what's going on in the brain. So given that there's some wiggle room here, is there any way to decide how to think about computers? Or should we just think of them as on the way to surpass us, as some kind of better version of us? Well, I think the criteria has to be pragmatic. If we think computer about computers in a certain way, and it makes our engineering sloppy, or it makes outcomes worse, maybe then that's not the right way to think about computers. And so what I'd argue is that the AI way of thinking about computers is pragmatically bad because it makes for lesser engineering and poor outcomes. Now, <laughs> that's not a popular thing to say because all the money is flowing to AI. If you want to encourage your kid on a major, you know, hey, get your PhD in AI, you'll, you know, your, your ticket's written at that point. I mean, it's, it is the popular paradigm right now. Uh, I'll try to approach why I think this is wrong in two quick ways, and then I'll be done. Oh no, I'm gonna play some music too, uh, on that. Uh, <laughs> the first way, I'll, I'll revisit the old Turing test. You remember the Turing test? So, um, in serious debating circles about consciousness, uh, the Turing test has long been considered um, sloppy and it's obsolete, but I'll use it anyway, because I think the whole thing's sloppy and obsolete. Um, in the Turing test, you have first, the man and the woman trying to fool a judge with little slips of paper, right? And then you replace the woman with a person. And the idea is that if the judge can't distinguish them, then uh, the person from the computer, then the computer has elevated to some in some way. It's achieved some sort of human equivalency. And what other test could there be? Um, and I should say, if you read the original Turing remarks, they're not actually quite like that. They're very interesting and spiritual, and they have a very different quality than the usual telling, but I'm just telling the, the canonical version that we all know. So here's what I'd observe about that. Since we're just asking whether the judge can discriminate, there's another possibility, which is that maybe the judge lowered his or her discrimination to the point that the judge became stupid enough to be unable to tell them apart. So the judge could have become stupid, or the other person behind the curtain could have become stupid so as to make themselves indistinguishable from the computer. So I want to point out that there's a two out of three chance that it's human stupidity and not machine intelligence that is being <laughs> detected when the Turing test is passed. Now, um, I think this is exactly what happens. This is exactly what happens when an algorithm tells you who to date and where, what degree to get and all this stuff. You, you, you subtly lower the context in order to make the, val the, the, the algorithm seem valuable. When you say the algorithms conquer chess or go, you're also saying that the whole human element of psyching out your opponent never mattered and that was only the moves, when in fact it used to be a holistic pursuit. You've dumbed yourself down. Do you see it? Now let me give you another example just like that, but this brings in an economic component. Um, way back, <laughs> going into the 50s, even before I knew Marvin, there's a classic story that he designed some grad students to just do natural language translation. Here's, uh, here's a Chomskyan model and here's some dictionaries and you should just be able to get natural language translation. Of course that didn't work. So instead, 
what worked is many years later in the 90s, uh, initially scientists at IBM realized you could do it with big data. And if you had a sufficiently large corpus of examples, you could do statistical correlations and you could get something usable, a giant mashup of examples. Um, we've gotten better and better at that. Uh, Google and Microsoft are the two principal providers of it now. And the result has been this huge loss of um, employment for translators. And I could, there, that's a very interesting thing to look at in detail because actually a small minority of them have done well, but overall they've seen their careers uh, decimated. Very similar to the pattern we see in uh, recording musicians, investigative journalists, photographers, same story. But here's the trick. Language is alive. Every single day brings news, brings pop culture, brings social media activity, and you have to replenish your example set for the translations to work on a daily basis. So how do you do it? Well, what you do is you steal, without notice or permission, tens of millions of phrase examples every single night from all over the globe from people who don't know what's being done to them, from amateurs who are adding subtitles to videos, all kinds of people. So we're saying, hey, you're buggy whips. You're obsolete. The, our electronic brain has surpassed you. Oh, but we need you, we need to steal from you. We need your data. It's dishonest, it's cruel, it's not sustainable. And if you extend it to everything, if everything's gonna become AI, it becomes total economic ruin based on an absurdity, based on a lie. So anyway, this is what I told the students. This was my answer. I was gonna say, there is a way to reframe this where there is no AI, AI isn't a thing. What there is is a future with a lot of great big computers and networks, and you could look to it forward to a future of providing incredible data through it, helping other people through this thing, but don't believe in the AI, and all of a sudden the future clarifies. So that's what I told them. I don't know if it got through. All right, I'm gonna play a bit of music too. Anybody know what this is? It's a shang, it's from China, it's very ancient. Um, this particular one is a very piercing version, and I'm going to use it as a ritual instrument to purge the uh, MIT, Harvard, and greater Boston community of bad AI mythology. <laughs> Are you good? That's good. Yeah. No, we'll talk more. We'll talk more. Don't worry. We'll have plenty of time. That was awesome. Thank you. So, yeah, Sue, yeah. please. Yeah. Good. Um, hi. Um, thank you. <laughs> I did not bring my instrument, so um, I'm just going to have to suffice with me. Um, so the last time I shared the stage with Jaron, it was appropriately the 50th anniversary of the National Endowment of the Humanities, a government program that uh, the Trump administration has been trying unsuccessfully to get rid of uh, in each of its last proposed budgets. Um, and the last thing I said that day was that we should stop calling our phones smart. I wasn't being glib. Calling phones smart is being glib. It's mindlessly seeding an essentially human attribute to an inanimate object imbued with powers created and deployed by human ingenuity. So if the question that we're dealing with here today, one of the questions is, how do we preserve our humanity amidst increasingly invasive technologies? The first thing to consider is our language. Adjectives matter and analogies matter, 
They're not neutral. They can be co-opted, and they can co-opt us. So I'm a journalist, um, as you now know, um, and I write a lot about Facebook and Google, uh, two companies that I'm sure all of you know a lot about. Um, you probably have a Facebook page, unless you've read Jaron's last book. Um, uh, but I have no doubt that you use the Google search engine. Um, and most of us know that uh, these are the two biggest advertising platforms on the planet, the two biggest advertising pl uh, platforms that have ever been invented. And we think we know what that means, um, that they take our data and they enable marketers to target us with ever more specific uh, uh, in information, um, things for us, things that are more personal. Um, and that's true. They do that for products, and they do that for politics. And what they're doing is, is reducing the truth of who we are by what we buy or what we're interested in, by where we live, our zip code, um, by our marital status, um, by who we know. Um, all the while, they're suggesting that this is in our best interest because it's personal, even if it's not. Um, a couple of years ago, I uh, participated in um, a bit of an experiment. Um, I allowed the champions of psychographic targeting, the uh, Cambridge University psychoanalytic or psycho, uh, psychographic um, institute to determine who I was based on my Facebook likes. Um, and so they had access to my Facebook page and, and then at the end, they were gonna tell me who I was. And who I was, according to the good people of Cambridge, was a gay, male, conservative Republican. <laughs> um, so that's silly. Um, but we, as we saw in, in the 2016 election, it's also really dangerous. Um, and one of the uh, in so far enduring benefits of that uniquely human endeavor, journalism, is that we're now aware of this. But a contiguous danger of all of these massive uh, advertising operations is that we've come to accept that our primary economic function in a digital world is as suppliers of data points. Um, at Davos one year, the conversation was that data was going to be the new oil, which is to say the commodification of you and me. So to answer it in a very dark way, uh, the other question raised by Marcelo, what does it mean to be human in a technological age? It means that you and I are the grease that lubricates this machine. And for the most part, we're fine with that. So fine that instead of challenging it, some of us are buying into schemes to get paid for letting companies like Nike have access, say, to our Fitbits. And one rationale of this is that they're gonna do it anyhow. Um, they're gonna take the data for free. Um, like, for instance, um, insurance companies are now um, using it, taking it for free, and then, say, taking a, a picture that you've posted on Instagram and using that to raise your rates. Um, this is not just the point of, if you're not paying for the product, you're the product. Um, it's, it's that implicit in that statement is an exception, exception of a very strange distortion of capitalism. Before, the distinction was between workers and the owners of the means of production. But in the digital economy, we've become wholly owned subsidiaries of apps and platforms. We've essentially handed over ownership of ourselves. And I'm really sorry, Marcelo, this is a dark answer to what I think was supposed to be uh, an inherently optimistic question. But as you know, when we were talking back there, we were all getting very depressed, so sorry. <laughs> um, but when Marcelo first raised the question and asked me to participate in this conversation, it occurred to me that the operative word in that, sent in that question was meaning rather than human. Um, we're all human beings, right? So we're all human. So that's not the nut that he was asking to have cracked. Um, but meaning is a whole other order of magnitude. Um, it's really, it's loaded. Um, you know, and it's been parsed by philosophers and people uh, who uh, study philosophy and religion and a host of other intellectual and uniquely human inquiries. Um, 
And in the past, really for the longest time, when we asked that question, what does it mean to be human, we defined ourselves in opposition to animals. Not always to other animals, but to animals as other. Um, so we were rational. We could think. We kokoto ergo sum. We used symbolic language. We could look ahead and plan. We used and made tools. We made music. Um, <laughs> we developed systems of belief. We had a soul. Um, technology has changed that dichotomy. Now we find ourselves in the position of having to distinguish ourselves from machines. I'm not talking about the singularity, that very strange desire to achieve immortality by downloading the contents of one's brain onto a chip implanted into some kind of robotic device. That vision continues to capture the imagination of people who would like to stick around long enough to watch the sea levels rise, the sixth extinction segue into the seventh, and, the, and witness, if not get caught up in whatever uh, resource wars are in the offing. It's always seemed futuristic, and it remains so, um, even as we've watched advances in neural implants and their success in helping, say, people who have spinal uh, cord injuries operate robotic arms just with their minds, and the development of chips uh, designed to supersede damaged hip hippocampus, hippocampi in people with uh, Alzheimer's disease. But we've always imagined the future to be cleaved from the present. We've imagined it to be a place very different from the one that we inhabit, when in fact, the future is constantly being attained incrementally. Obviously, there are breakthroughs that demarcate a then and a now, but for the most part, we move forward inexorably. So the singularity may seem to be far in the distance still, but the reason we're having this conversation today is because humans are merging with technology in ways both obvious and not so obvious, but with enough velocity and substance that we have to pause to ask this fundamental question about preserving our humanity. You know this picture. You might be in this picture. Someone's walking down the street and they're just looking at their phone. Or people are, got people sitting at a table and all of them are staring at their device. It's such a common image now that it's become a cliche. Um, there was a study uh, last year by the accounting firm Deloitte um, that found that people check their phones on average 52 times a day. And if you're a millennial, uh, it's around 86 times. Um, a study from the UK found that people were spending about 24 hours a, a week online, so a full day online. Um, but they also found a sizable number of people um, spending 40 hours or more online. Uh, I am actually telling you nothing that you don't know. In fact, some of you might be looking at your phones right now or itching to look at your phones right now. Um, and this is by design, uh, which is to say the designers deliberately sought to engage neurobiology when they wrote their code. Dopamine is a very powerful neurotransmitter, as all addicts know. Social media, in some instances, make people more social in that it facilitates a kind of human interaction, but to a large extent, those interactions do not make us happier or more fulfilled. There's a phenomenon known as status envy that has been associated with passive viewing of Facebook, and status envy has been linked to depression. Just last month, the Pew Research Center reported that most US teenagers see anxiety and depression as a major problem among their peers. So to recap, social media, while connecting us to each other through the mediation of our devices, can't achieve the basic effective rewards of a physical community, but it does make us more connected to our devices. Then there's memory, which we've outsourced, especially to Google, um, it's not that memory is a uniquely human activity, but both, say, scholarship and the serendipitous pursuit of knowledge is. The last book I wrote, which Marcelo mentioned, uh, was about a library. And in the past year or so, I have spent a lot of time in libraries and a lot of time talking about libraries. And I cannot tell you how many times I have heard that libraries are now obsolete since we have Google. And here's the argument, which I lifted from a blog post on 
TechCrunch, which, by the way, I read regularly, which is why the data scientists, the brilliant people at Cambridge University, assumed I was male, which should tell you a lot. Okay, so here it goes. Here's what they said. It's hard not to imagine a future when the majority of libraries cease to exist, at least as we currently know them. Not only are they being rendered obsolete in a digital world, the economics make even less sense. The internet has replaced the importance of libraries as a repository for knowledge, and digital distribution has replaced the role of a library as a central hub for obtaining the containers of such knowledge, books. And digital bits have replaced the need to cut down trees to make paper and waste ink to create those books. And so the writer concludes, this is evolution, not devolution. So I am now going to beg to differ, but with a caveat. It's a noticeable human disposition to favor the future, to look to the future with hope, and typically assume that the future will deliver us to some place better than the place we are now, and that this is progress, and that progress is good. I'm not saying that this is 100% true, and with climate change bearing down on us, it may become less true, but even there, one might attribute complacency to an underlying belief that there will be a fix for this problem in the future. We are, after all, an ingenious species. And so when we ask how can we retain our humanity as we become more and more digitized, as we conflate aut automation with autonomy, we have to be aware that we're gonna be accused of many things. Being a Luddite, for example, or anti-progressive, or a dope. Be prepared for that. But resistance is not the same thing as rejection. And it becomes more and more important to add some resistance, some friction, to what may feel like the inevitable slide to total digital connectivity. The 5G world that we've been told is coming soon and coming fast. As you may have read, I think this weekend even, in the New York Times, the community that appears to be leading this resistance is actually located in Silicon Valley, where parents are for forbidding their children to, from using uh, phones and iPads. And they're trying really hard to get them into the Waldorf school where they are compelled to spend a lot of time outdoors. Um, it's really easy to be cynical about this. These are the folks that brought us to this point after all. But it may be a better idea to pay attention to them and follow their lead. Unfortunately, though, it looks like the coming, coming digital divide may not be between those who have fast internet and those who have no internet, but between those who have the luxury of disconnecting and those who have no choice but to view the world or have the world mediated by a digital connection. Just last week, a man was handed an iPad and told by a disembodied doctor on the screen that he was going to die. So much for the laying on of hands. And last fall, over 100 students walked out of their Brooklyn High School to protest their school's reliance on a Facebook-designed and funded educational platform that required them to sit in front of their computers all day teaching themselves. I would venture a guess that there is no one at BBNN who sits in front of a computer all day teaching themselves. The kind of resistance demonstrated by those students likely made more people question the assumptions of the pr about the primacy of technology. It also highlighted a new kind of inequality that many of us might have not seen coming. Those students, seems to me, were on to something else. Their actions suggested that the question being raised here is actually the answer. As a species, we will retain our humanness, our capacity for wonder and exploration, our skepticism, our humor, our connections to each other, by demanding that technology is built from the start, taking all of that into account. Or that it is not built if it can't. This is a choice, and we declare our humanness by our agency. Just as adjectives matter, design matters. And in the meantime, there's poetry. Thank you. Thank you.
great. Thank you so much. Okay, so now we uh, will talk a little bit about this. Try not to depress everybody. <laughs> I mean, we, we were struggling back there. I said, what are we going to do? Because, you know, if we start really thinking about this, it, it really becomes kind of difficult, right, to kind of see the bright future. So, so let's, first of all, for, for just for, for the benefit of everyone, it would be good, maybe, Jaron, if you could define the differences between soft AI, which is what everybody's talking about, machine learning, and the real Marvin Minsky hard AI. I, you know, Marvin, when I was a postdoc at Fermilab, Marvin came and gave one of his talks. He just did the Society of the Mind there. Mm -hmm. And during the, um, the, the questions, you know, I was, I don't know, 28 or something. I said, but wait a second. If you really believe machines are going to think, are they all also going to develop psychosis, schizophrenia? <laughs> are they going to become crazy? And his answer, he didn't even, you know, was, of course. And then I said, so does that mean you're going to have machine therapists, you know, which are going to be other machines, take care of those machines? And uh, he's like, very possibly. So anyway, the point is, it should, it's important, I think, to distinguish between the intelligence that we are seeing everywhere when you go to San Francisco, you know, AI, machine learning, et cetera, et cetera, and what Nick Bostrom, for example, is talking when he talks about super intelligence and us being wiped out by a very intelligent computer or not. <laughs> I'll disagree. Wait, is this on? Hello. Yeah, yeah. I'll disagree with you. Good. I <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there, the, um, neither means a thing. They're both points of rhetoric. They're both aesthetics for how to think about modernity. They're both mm -hmm. storytelling for how we think about the future, and they function hand in hand. So you can't, I mean, uh, Bostrom stuff doesn't mean anything. Soft AI doesn't mean anything. It's just like sort of one way to interpret what you're doing with code. Mm -hmm. You can absolutely do everything that you call AI and think of it not as AI, and I think you'll be a better engineer for it. Right, uh, right. So, so um, to, there, I don't think the distinction between soft and hard AI is useful. In fact, I think it's, it's a... a D um, a damaging distinction mm. because it lets soft AI off the hook. Um, so th there's a lot of ways of talking about AI that just reinforce the AI mythology. If you say, oh, AI is dangerous, it reinforces that AI is even a thing. Mm -hmm. If you say, well, there's a difference between soft AI and hard AI, then it lets you call all the really lunatic people hard AI, but then you still have the <laughs> soft AI, which is a thing. But AI is not a thing at all. Like there's this other point of view where none of it's anything. It's just a way of thinking about code. It's sort of like, um, it's just a way of thinking. It's like saying, I'm a romantic. I'm an AI believer. It's just a way, it's a romantic attitude towards computers, essentially. And there's, it's not absolutely false, but I just think it's pragmatically damaging. So I just don't think any form of AI is even a thing at all. Okay. All right. I do think the algorithms function. I've contributed. I've sold a machine vision company to Google. I've played the game. It's great. It's lucrative. Um, love the algorithms. Really interested in them. There's some actual. Actually, if you just think of it as math, it's gotten really interesting lately. I think it's great. But the, the AI mythology is totally rejectable. But the change is happening. I mean, mark, the market force the is change, pushing it very but hard. But the market force is always based on human belief. It's what people think of. The price of something is set by the human perception of it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not actually, AI is not a thing. It's a cultural change that people raising money through the mythology of AI have convinced everybody else to buy into. Mm -hmm. That is happening. Okay. And algorithms are getting interesting, and computers are getting faster and all that. That's all real. That's true. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a little bit like um, a, a gestalt thing where you can switch foreground and background. There's this transformation you can experience in your head where you see all the same stuff, you see all the same results, you can read all the same papers, look at all the same math, look at all the same things, but there's just no AI there. Right. And when you can experience that reversal, it's, it's like so good. All of a sudden, <laughs> computer science has come back as an actual rigorous field. It's an actual science again. It's no longer an al alchemical quest for the divine. Good. It's like this other, yeah. it's, it, you just it, you get rid of all the crap and you can actually um, be empirical again. It's, it's a wonderful release to actually see this clearly. And all you have to do is not believe in AI as a thing. Good. <laughs> well, I'm good with that. <laughs> and <clears throat> it's good. Because you know, you, when, you, when you're talking, you mention 
consciousness and subjectivity as things that mm -hmm. we don't even know how to define, which you probably meant or not, that you really can't put that stuff in an algorithm right now. No, no, I'm saying something a little different than that. Mm. I'm saying that we don't know if we can. It's, it's really right. important. I mean, there's yeah. a, uh, to really dig into this, you have to, um, if you want to be formal and rigorous, you have to um, take a skeptical position about all of this. You can't say, oh, I believe that consciousness is a special thing, because you can't defend that either. Um, that's why I'm, what I'm saying, the, 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 <clears throat> the right way to criticize the mythology of AI or the sense that AI is even anything at all is on a pragmatic basis. And to recognize that there's really no, it's, it's, I mean, because it's like, it is a religion. It's like, it's like mm -hmm. going to somebody who d d deeply adheres to Zoroastrianism or whatever yeah. it is and saying, oh, what a bunch of nonsense, you know, like, you can't, that's ridiculous. I can't, if somebody really believes that machines are coming alive, I'm not going to criticize the religion. What I am going to do is I'm going to say, maybe religion isn't the way we should be deciding you know, who gets health care or whatever. I mean, like, maybe that is not the right system to apply mm -hmm. there. And that's totally reasonable. Mm -hmm. And every functioning, every functioning society depends on being able to draw those lines. Yeah, it's the rapture of the nerds. The rapture <laughs> of the nerds. Yeah, that's a... Uh, was that mine? I forget. Somebody, somebody wrote yeah, that Yeah, yeah, it was uh, Mark... Mark, Mark O'Connell said that in his book, To Be a Machine. Okay. Yeah, the whole transcendent I, uh, kind so, of transhumanism. It's like yeah, the rapture but, of but the, the nerds. But, but the you thing know, is, you so. can't... There's a danger in saying, oh, the, 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 um, uh, the Ray Kurzweil's or whatever, those are the crazy ones, but normal AI people at respectable places. Mm -hmm. Even they're also crazy. There's absolutely no reason to believe in AI. And I'm talking about my direct colleagues who I adore. I mean, I, but I just think this is a crazy belief. Okay. Good. This is... Um, this is one of these thought structures like believing in the deep state or something like that. There are these things people can come to believe in that aren't really necessary beliefs. Okay. They're a way of organizing the world that's really optional. And if it's not helping, get rid of it. So that's optimistic. <laughs> I mean, really? You know, right? It's funny. In, I, I, I ran out of time because I tend to go on too long. So I didn't actually get to the thing I told the student or the, that new idea. So maybe if somebody can ask me what my new idea actually is, then I'll tell you. Yes, yes. <laughs> so meanwhile, right, Sue, so, I mean, um, how do you see, you talked about resistance, right, in some way. So how do you see that happening in practice? You know, I have, I have one opinion about this, but I would love to hear how do you see this actually gaining force, apart from the, 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 the movement that is coming in from, from inside the, the, yeah. the tech industry? So, what about people just yeah, like us? Yeah, so we we're, we were talking about this a little bit back there before we got really depressed. Um, mm -hmm. So there, it seems to me there are three lo places where there, there's, there's some resistance into the system. Um, and the first one uh, was the one we were talking about most uh, directly, which is that there's um, a, a resistance coming from inside uh, the tech companies themselves. Um, there's a, a group called, uh, it's just like the Tech Workers um, Alliance or something like that, I can't remember what the name is. Um, uh, but, and which is very important, obviously, because um, they are actually doing the work. Um, and they're, uh, putting up some resistance to uh, partly the market um, forces and the PR forces that are pushing them in a particular direction. Um, we have government um, regulations, uh, not very much in this country, but uh, there has been a little bit of that, some talk of that. Um, there is, at the moment, um, the possibility that the FTC will have uh, a little more um, uh, kind of power to, to regulate, um, to levy fines. There's a big fine, potentially billions of dollars that's going to be um, in the offing for uh, Facebook for having um, gone and uh, not abided by a, a, a consent decree to not steal people's data. Um, and then um, the third one is, 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 is having this conversation, is, mm. is just people, the consciousness that people have, and then sort of uh, you know, essentially voting with their fingers, i.e. stopping, you know, don't use that product, don't do this, don't do that. And as people stop doing those things, they stop having the power that they have right now. So I think it's coming, I think it's coming from these different directions. Um, yeah. uh, and I think the fact that 
that, that it's, it's a conversation at all um, is, a, is a form of resistance. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. No, that's, uh, that's exactly right. Uh, do you want to ask questions to one another? I, mean, I, I, have I, I have a question. Yeah. You. Um, when you say that AI is, is, is kind of like its conception and it's, it's, re it's a rhetorical device and it doesn't mm -hmm. exist, um, which I, I think I understand what you're saying, um, my guess is that um, not everyone knows exactly what, what you mean by that. Um, oh, I, I, you're right about that. Yeah. It's very hard to get the point across. Right. So um, can, you, can you be more specific and, and, and sort of explain, because it seems to me that one of the things that we're all inundated with is the rhetorical um, kind of marketing, um, so that's one thing. But then, you know, we're looking at, say, self-driving cars and, um, uh, you know, robotic surgery or whatever, whatever the things are that we're being told that the reason why we can have these things now is because now we have better AI. Mm -hmm. um, so why do we have these things now or why are we getting these things now and we didn't have them before? Mm. Well, so... Fly-by-wire technology in aviation has existed for a long time. As soon as it got called AI, we decided we didn't have to train the pilots to use <laughs> it anymore because it was AI. And then the plane crashed. And then the planes crashed, and now this whole series of planes is grounded, and one of America's important industrial companies is in deep trouble. So that's AI. That's what it is. OK. <laughs> <laughs> but people are buying it like crazy. Yeah, no, it's such. And the thing is, That's so I'm also a musician, and one of the things, um, if you're playing a jazz club and then somebody else is playing during their set, you always clap from behind to try to create the emotional contagion to get the audience to clap. Um, it's your duty. It's like this you're promoting the idea that being in a jazz club is cool, that listening to music is cool, and that you're an enthusiastic audience and what's on stage is great. And you all contribute to that for each other. Mm -hmm. And we all do that in the tech world. And it's just this constant bar bombardment every single day with stories about AI. The um, uh, Google's uh, little um, uh, uh, search page animation was like, oh, we'll be Bach. Yes. We'll simulate Bach. Why would they do that? Because it's reinforcing Google's stock value. It's, it's, it's like retelling the mythology and pounding on you on the head with it. In every single story, there's some, every single day, there's this story again and again and again. And um, I, it's a constant, and, every, and people in the industry know they have to keep on doing it. It is our value. So one of the things that was really, I don't, did, you, did all of you notice this kind of very interesting Google doodle uh, a couple of days ago? where you, you, there was a staff, a trouble staff, and you could write, um, you could write a melody. <clears throat> and, then, and then there was a, a kind of magic thing that was going on, and it said, um, it would go, it, we're going to look at, uh, I don't know, what was it, like 306 um, pieces by Bach, and we're going to harmonize your melody to sound like what Bach would sound like if Bach had written your Melody. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys saw it. It was it was fun. It was actually really really fun to do, and but when I was doing it, I was thinking a couple things. One of the things I was thinking was, if you're if you're Bach, you've invented this. You've figured this exactly. out. Even if the algorithms that Bach had mm -hmm. in his head came from listening to lots of other music prior to Bach, it was Bach's. And the thing that was so disturbing about this thing that I suddenly was Bach was that I had nothing to do with it. It had nothing to do with creativity. And one of the problems with machine learning or with AI or with this kind of way of proceeding is that it doesn't allow for the Stockhausens or the Jackson Pollocks or it doesn't allow for um, a kind of paradigm break with what's happened before. Everything that is gonna happen has already happened in some fashion already. And it was, it was, it, it was chilling at the end. You know, I was like, oh wow, I'm Bach. And like, oh wow, I am actually not Bach. <laughs> right, and I think that's the breaking point, right? To me, I see whenever a machine can become a new Bach, 
that creates a completely different way of composing that is actually resonating with human emotions in no, very no, no, deep no, no. ways. My friend. No? <laughs> it's already happening? There's no, no, it's not going to happen. There's no Bach achievement meter. You can't go... No, of course, but it, that's a, a metaphor. You can only do Turing test-like things. It's all in your discrimination. So what will have happened at that point is your perception of Bach will have become degraded enough that it'll seem true to you. It's very important no, no, to I realize don't. that that's an equally valid interpretation. I'm not saying one is absolutely true and the other is absolutely false. I'm saying that there's no... There's no truth value to what you just said. It's a cultural preference that you're expressing, and you have to get to the point of seeing that, that it's not a real thing. No, I get it. No, I'm not talking about the machine, another ma a machine copying back to perfection. I don't really care about that. I think that's actually horrible. I'm talking about the new amazing composer. That's what I'm talking about, too. <laughs> Even oh, you more think so. that's going to happen? No, no, no. No, it no, no, no. What you're saying is an absurd statement. You're saying something wow. that can have no truth value. Okay. You're, you're expressing a preference and treating it as something that's a, that's a rigorously evaluatable claim, and it isn't. And I need you to see that. And I know it's hard How because you you're bombarded the... every single day with, the, with rhetoric that indicates that that's a meaningful thing to say, but it isn't. You would see, the, the thing is, art is subjective, right? And so radicalness, interest, uh, all these things are things that you perceive. And so if you've been hypnotized to perceive that a program is this new radical artist, it's an entirely possible thing for you to perceive. There's no absolute truth to it. Art has to be something that's experimental and intuitive, and it can't be proven, and there isn't any absolute to it. And you have to believe in your own interiority and accept a kind of, ultimately, I, be, I guess a little bit, if you're going to perceive art at all, you have to perceive it from kind of a mystical place. And if, you, if you're willing to perceive that in an in algorithm, it basically is the same thing as writing a check to Google, which is, <laughs> which, which is so it becomes an economic ripoff. I don't know how to get, this like, seems so obvious no, to me, I don't know how I to get it across because everybody else is hypnotized. You're all crazy. Um, actually, actually, I'm seeing exactly the same thing you are. Uh -huh. Maybe you are hypnotized by your, by your rhetoric because I'm <laughs> saying exactly the same thing because uh -huh. I'm saying that there are, there, yes, art speaks to us in very intuitive and semi-mystical ways, as you uh -huh. like to say, which I love. But, you know, there is Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. And they're different from Salieri and other minor composers. There is something about them that speaks highly to what they created. And so what I'm saying is that I would like to see a machine become the next B in this sequence of three guys. And if you're but saying that... Finding that machine is going to be degrading my level of what I think is Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. I think you're mistaken because I think that's degrading the human spirit. Mm. Well, see, no. I, I adore Bach and Beethoven, and I've played them furiously. And Marvin Minsky used to improvise in Bach style beautifully and in other styles and all that. Um, the thing is, though, um, in a way, AI is inheriting a certain kind of a thing that happened that was also a mistake. So look, as you know, you have to raise money for your organization, and musicians are all about the hustle. There's always like, how do you raise money? And so going back to Bach and Beethoven, like they had to impress and flatter patrons, and there was this whole economy that was built around creating a kind of a perception of a supernatural status of the great composers which funded the whole enterprise, and we're all in on it, and that's great. But the truth is, Salieri wasn't all that bad. He was kind of interesting, and <laughs> he was and, very uh, famous. And uh, yeah. there's a lot of there's that's a lot of cool. Actually, there's so many lesser known composers in history if, uh, that are astonishing, and there's so much music out there in the world that's so incredible. And um, there's nothing wrong with worshiping, uh, you know, Beethoven or or Bach. I mean, it's easier because they're dead. Um, but <laughs> uh, I, I'm just saying that, that we, we have a tendency to, in our aesthetics, to create this sort of superhuman status in artists, and that was an economic ploy. And it's in a sense, it was sort of like an early crude prototype for what Google and Facebook do today with machines. In, in a, you know. So I, I do think the situation's a little confusing, but um, I... Um, let, let me tr can I try a totally different yeah, tack on this? Yeah, yeah. So I do this sometimes with undergraduates who I have the same argument with, and so they'll say, well, what, uh, somebody will say, well, if a machine can start to write music, that's great, because then as music consumers, we have better music, and we don't have to pay the damn musicians, <laughs> and, and all this. And, this. and so I said, well, okay, let's, let me apply this to a different area of life. What if 
Google and Facebook told you, hey, we have these AIs out here, and these AIs are having better sex with each other than humans ever could, <laughs> would you say, oh, great, then they can have the good sex. We don't need it. That's impossible. And they're like, no, 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 wait, wait, <laughs> wait. Something, something just went awry here. Whoever is judging that doesn't have any idea what sex is. <laughs> yeah, well, substitute sex for music. Right, I guess. No, seriously, I, I mean, like, the point, like, is as soon as you take this consumer attitude about music, then AI can be a great musician. But, but it, it's a whole, there's exactly. a whole attitudinal yeah. frame good. that that's you have it. to adapt. That's, that's the point. That's, that's the convergence that point. That that's it. precisely <laughs> right. Stop. <Yeah. laughs> Wait, I can't keep talking. So that <laughs> restores the faith in humanity right there, right? That's, I was trying to right. very you hard got, to you got there. bring, so it works. <laughs> we hope. So there is something about us that's special, right? Oh, wow. Well. I, I, so, uh, you should say something. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. You said, oh, well, come on, bring it on. What do you mean? What do you mean, like, we we're special? I mean, we we're have, different. We're yeah, different. Very we're different. deeply different. Yeah, right? and we're not machines. Yeah. So, yeah. But we run the danger of being turned into machines well, by hypnosis by by ai that doesn't exist oh no, by market forces they're hypnotizing us to converge and use more and more machines right, 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 right. and push okay. the button to buy more racket tennis rackets because we like tennis and all that kind of stuff but we like the racket better than you know now we're pl just playing it virtually we're not actually playing tennis yeah and we're just thinking about it anyways there, there's um one concluding remark and oh, then we, we have are to move okay. on yes Hey, can I tell you the quick idea I ran out of time Please. for? Yes, yes. Um, I was going to tell you this idea, but I ran out of time because I do tend to go on. It's a problem. Um, <laughs> the idea is this. I've been thinking about this wave of horrible people all, all over the world in all these different situations who have something in common, which is the, uh, the, uh, the angry young man who feels he's not getting enough attention and just doesn't exist until he shoots a bunch of people or turns into a total jerk, and he gets that way online. We saw that with this, har this the, the, the shooter in the New Zealand mosque. We've seen it in Charlottesville. We've seen it in so many places. And these people all have this quality in common. And if you read their rhetoric, it's, there's a fascinating thing. They all go on and on and on about this thing they call replacement theory, which is this idea that white people are being replaced by non-white people. But the thing is, if you look at the Islamic people who are extreme, the ISIS people, they also are talking the same way, and they have the same way of saying, we're true Islam is being, we're being replaced by these fake people. And there's a, there's a sense of like these fake doppelgangers are coming to take over. In Charlottesville, the, the um, neo-Nazis chanted, you will not replace us, Jews will not replace us. And I was thinking about this replacement thing, and I have a theory that one part of what's going on that's a little different this time than what happened in the 30s, and other, every other time in history for so many. I think there's this feeling that people are wondering if they're obsolete. They're wondering if there's any place for them. Mm -hmm. Where I live in Silicon Valley, or if you live here, there's a place for you because you're close to the big computers. You'll be one of the big computer tenders. But if you're out there somewhere in the world and you're far from the big computers, you must. It, I think it feels like you're becoming obsolete, that there's no place for you, that modernity isn't your friend, modernity doesn't care about you, there's no future. And I wonder if this replacement feeling of resentment towards other humans is actually a displaced feeling of resentment towards our modern moment itself. Mm -hmm. um, um, if I was going to put it in some really striking way to get a headline out of a newspaper or something, I'd say maybe AI is actually the thing that people are, being, uh, are afraid of being replaced by, and that's what they really are shooting at, because um, they're p bombarded every single day with this rhetoric that they're going to be surpassed. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the thought. Mm -hmm. It's a very good thought, yeah. On that, <laughs> on that note, um, we have uh, about 20 minutes or so for questions from the audience. Please be brief and to the point so that everybody can... Unlike me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cheek, there we go. Thank you to the panel. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, I'm also a big fan of a TV show called Jeopardy. <laughs> and uh, one of the iterations on the show was to pair two human beings who were the two Jeopardy geniuses of the ages against a uh, 
quote unquote, machine named Watson. Uh, inevitably, Watson buzzed in before the two human beings. Uh, inevitably, Watson came up with the correct question. Uh, so my conclusion was that Watson is smarter than the two human beings. Am I correct? No. How about, I thought, well, how about Watson processes faster than yeah. those human beings? But what does that have to do with intelligence? No, it's a, it's a, it's, no, the correct thing is that IBM should be paying wages to all the people who contributed data to that algorithm Precise, because yeah. they, yeah. they programmed this thing for IBM. Uh, what it is is it's a human-created thing that a corporation pretended wasn't made by people in order to not pay the people. And once you see it that way, then it all starts to make sense. Yeah. That's, the, that's the ground truth. Yeah. And, and that actually could be a wonderful thing. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not anything in itself. It's, it is unpaid labor precisely. But even if it were paid, what? To if it what were end? paid, it would be. If it were paid, it would be like John Henry and the railroad. It would just be saying, well, like a whole factory of people making machines and working together cannot do one guy with a with a hammer, which is true. But it doesn't mean that those people in the factory shouldn't be paid. The difference is that these people aren't paid. I really think understanding this in terms of economics is the most clear way to get it. So if there's a way for us to work together to solve problems that we couldn't do before using computers and networks, that's great. I've devoted my life to that. So many people in computer science have. I worked really hard to, on this internet thing, <laughs> trying to get it to work a long time ago. That would be fantastic. If the Jeopardy thing is a demonstration of doing that, that's fantastic. But the AI component of it is just a way of not paying people. It's just a way of pretending that the people who actually did the work don't exist. And that will destroy the civilization by definition. If a civilization refuses to acknowledge its members, it implodes into nothingness. And that's precisely what Watson is doing. With all due respect to IBM that needs the brand recognition, and I want them to be successful, <laughs> but I just wish they'd find a different way. <laughs> What concerns me most, Sue, I think you used the word addiction. You were talking about people looking at their phones, and we all do. Uh, it's a variable reinforcement schedule, which in psychology is the strongest way to get people to do something. So that concerns me quite a bit. What concerns me more is that now, and I think we've all had this experience, you go to a restaurant and kids of every age, every age down to two, have a screen in front of them so that they don't disrupt the other diners at the restaurant. Instead, their parents give them a big kitty screen. Here, go play with this from the earliest age. That concerns me a great deal. Um, I'm happy my kids were the last generation <laughs> not to grow up with a screen in their hand from the time they could hold it. What should we do about that? Well, what should we do? Uh, more crayons. <laughs> uh, more, and more coloring books. Coloring books are coming back. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I, I keep thinking about, I live in Vermont, and um, I live in a place where we do not have uh, connectivity. Um, and, and I think that, um, I was thinking the other day that, that for, for the longest time, those places have been considered to be kind of like bad. You know, you can't get online. Pretty soon, they're going to be like the oasis of our, our society, the people are going to want to move to these places because they won't have that problem with their children. I, I, you know, this is a choice that people make. Um, it's easy. It's, it's sort of the equivalent of taking the TV that you used to, you know, people used to plop their kids down in front of and now we have that. So I, I, don't, I don't know, I, I'm with you, my daughter is too old now for that, happily, she's over there. <laughs> Uh, father of a 12-year-old daughter in, in, in the Bay Area, so deal with it all the time. Uh, my daughter's friends who have parents who work at the tech companies, it, it, the cliche is true, like they are forbidden. Like if they're gonna come over to our house, the parents will call and say, can you please make sure they don't get in front of a screen? Like, so I, I took a different tack with her. I, I did two things, and neither of them will scale for anybody else, but I'll tell you what I did. One thing is I took her to all the companies so she could see them. So she's been to Twitter and Snap and Facebook, and there's just like all these cubicle of uh, socially awkward nerds, and <laughs> there's this weird vibe, and she's like, ew. So like, for all, for all this information transparency, 
transparency, if it were genuinely two-way, it would solve itself. But it isn't. <laughs> the, the, if kids could really see behind the curtain, but of course there's no way to get the, a billion kids to visit these places, so that doesn't scale, but it works. And the other thing, <laughs> not to, um, at Microsoft we have a dying or almost dead uh, platform called the Windows Phone. So I gave her a Windows phone, and, and very little works, and none of the surveillance stuff works. And it's a great solution, because they can still do the basic stuff, but everything else is broken. And it's kind of cool. And so it like sort of solves the problem. Uh, yeah, so that's, those are my two little sneaky things. She's not listening right now. Uh, next question here to your left. Hi, uh, my name is Darian. Uh, so my, I'm an AI researcher at a uh, startup here. You don't um, exist. I don't, I don't exist. Uh, you're, wait, you said you're an AI researcher at MSR? No, no, uh, at a local startup here. Oh, a local startup. Okay, yeah. great. Um, and so uh, I think I get what you're getting at, which is um, when we think about AI, we have a tendency to think of it as a monolithic being. When In reality, when you're working with the foundational research, it's really a set of curated models looking at very specific small problems um, and that, you know, painting it as a single monolithic, uh, you know, Construction is problematic in, in many ways, right? One, it's problematic from our, our point of view as a startup because people have these crazy expectations for what a product can and can't do. But you know, I think in your point, also in terms of like framing human uh, meaning and understanding, you know, it's problematic because we elevate it to a level of coherence that it perhaps isn't. Um, and so, I think that's what I understand from how you're framing this. The question I have for you is, I guess. Getting back to your student's original question, which is what is the purpose of human life, even if we were to re remove AI as a reference right, um, of human meaning, I think it still fails to understand the fundamental problem, which is that human meaning um, is something that's a deeply subjective uh, and a personal thing. The way in which we define meaning for ourselves is something that you know is an internal conversation that we have with us. Um, and that if we don't look at I think one of the challenges I have, um, I come from an Eastern culture, I mean, I'm a Hindu, and we, we don't often have an individualist way of framing our identity, is that you know, in the US and in, in Western civilization, we frame human value as essentially an external thing. So it's the value provided to society, or you know, it is the things that you do or the things that you produce. Um, and I agree that that in itself is problematic, but changing the reference from AI to something else doesn't get at that problem, I think. Um, and then the question that I have then is like, where are your points of resistance and what is your intervention space? Right? So it's either a deeply personal thing that you need to do on your own, but that fails at getting at global things where you could have systems that you know, allow you to basically render human life meaningless and allow for state violence and allow for other things. Um, or if, you have, if you're looking at it as an engagement with you know, these larger institutions, you look right into a collective action problem, which is you don't have enough mass to actually make meaningful change. So I don't, I don't really know where to, I guess, frame um, the conversation and where to frame, I guess, our interventions here? Well, I suggest economics as the solution. So in your startup, look at all your training sets. I don't know what you do, but there was somebody involved in producing every bit that came into whatever algorithm you use. There aren't any angels or aliens who've shown up who are providing us with corpora for our research. Pay those people, and suddenly you'll have a feeling for where the line of humanity is. If you don't pay them, you're living in a dreamland where you're pretending, and that's dangerous. Pay them, and then you'll know. And then, and then you'll start to get a feeling for who they are, what they do, what it means, and who, I mean, like, that's, that's the way to acknowledge people. And I, I, um, I, I don't quite buy your East-West distinction, just in the sense that when you really go into the literature, into Western, literature it's not there's a lot of mystical stuff it's not that different and a lot of these honestly a lot of eastern cultures are kind of exploitative in a similar way have a, there's a precedent in the caste system to what's going on right now we're creating a caste system but in the tech companies taking over the world and it's based on how close you are to the computer so i'm a brahmin you know in this world a reluctant one and and so anyway I, those are some thoughts but um, pay the people who are responsible for your data existing on every level even if they were even measured passively and then think about your philosophy again and i think you'll notice that it's shifted i i, I worry about paying um <clears throat> you know, i'm not opposed to getting paid um but i worry that um it, it lets the companies off a little too easy um so you take their data you pay them um, and then you do creepy things with it. 
Um, mm. and, but you've already, you know, you've exonerated yourself. You've paid them. So at what point, so, so how do you, how do you, so, when, so, yeah, no, I have an answer for that. Oh, good. The point, the point <laughs> is when the people can collectively bargain and have enough power to charge enough that it cancels out the creepiness, that it's, t it's too expensive to be creepy. That's the point where it's fixed. So this is a whole other thing about what the new economics theory has to be like, but in order to correct for the disasters that we're creating in the world, we have to have the people who supply the data that runs everything be able to collectively bargain to get enough money for it. <coughs> and that should equalize at a point where it undoes creepiness. Okay, but, um, but, but, but that's every single person in this room and every person walking down the street. And every that's person, correct. Right. Um, uh, it's hard to organize unions. Um, how do we organize all of us? Well, we have this thing called the internet that makes organizing people better. Ah, uh, no, like, not really. No, no, no. I, I actually think this whole thing could turn around. I, I really, I, I'm going to... Wow, it's getting really optimistic now. I'm going to try to be... No, I am going to try to be optimistic about this because I remember the ideas from the start of it and I remember how they went bad and the... the the good ideas haven't been disproven yet. They've never been. T they've never get been given an honest chance yet, and I still think we can. Tr I think we can at least try. I mean, the problem is that there's such a astonishing centralization of power about everything in the internet, where there's just a few companies that are kind of running everything, despite the illusion of socialist openness for everybody. Um, that the idea space that's been explored is minuscule, despite all this talk about the radical Silicon Valley and all the startups. Everybody's almost the same. There's actually massive conformity, and um, I, uh, I'm really, I don't know how long it'll take, but I'm really hope, I'm really hopeful that by testing alternate ideas, we can come up with systems that work better. Um, one of the problems right now is that there's a, uh, an incredible incrustation of complacency and, and uh, fatalism. Everybody believes that everything, every single article about Facebook is, Facebook is horrible, it's destroying the world and nothing can be done. It always ends up at the, the last line is always, we're stuck with this, our, our world is shit forever. Sorry for the language. And, and uh, I, I simply will not go there. I just refuse to go there. Okay. <laughs> okay, we're going to have our last question because we're kind of hitting a wall over there. So, um, hello. Hello, my name's Will. Oh, hey. A friend of Jaren. I love this man. <laughs> it's great to be here. Um, I had a question that was kind of answered and reset again, and it, Sue made a really amazing point about choices. I'm a musician, an artist, travel the world a lot, and studied a lot of indigenous cultures. I studied on Bajaran notes. I lived abroad for many years, studying different types of music and science and technology and life, etc. And I find it interesting that in those places, when this process began, we talked about what we know about our thoughts and our ideas, like love and compassion and this. And I, find, I've, I found it easier to, it's a more tangible object in places that didn't have this technology, where there were cultures that sit around a fire or have a conversation or you're around your grandparents often. I think about the way I grew up versus the way my, my children are growing up. My grandparents and great-grandparents were around, so I got to see my mother get chastised by my grandmother, which was fantastic. <laughs> 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 because there was a time growing up where I thought she was the queen and I realized she wasn't. So, but, it was, but that order created another kind of a concept in my mind on order and on information and on age and on respect. So it kind of was very tangible and kind of really organic. And I guess with, with all of you being familiar with the technology and familiar with being a parent and being into things like music and films, where, where, is the, where do you think that bridge can be created between both of those things without losing a plot on one or having the other one sound really ancient and, and the digital side sound like this is new and what's happening. Because I have children as well and I brought them up on vinyl and going to the library and getting library cards and for every book my daughter downloads, she has to read two books actually, hardcover books, so she can look up a book and she can understand what a glossary means and a dictionary, etc. So where is the bridge between the technology side and the actual, I'll call it the analog or organic side. Go. <laughs> <laughs> this guy has to, has to listen to me too much already. You should, you should take it. Oh, gosh. Um, where's the bridge? You're the bridge. You just told us you were the bridge. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it's, it, you know, the, the Calvary isn't coming for you. 
you are the Calvary, exactly. and you figured it out. Um, and I, I actually think that w for a while in there, we were all so enamored of this stuff that we didn't really have much skepticism. We didn't really question it. Mm -hmm. And I think we're questioning it, but we're not rejecting it completely. And so I think that this is what we do now. You know, we're trying to figure this out, and, and, and I'm not sure it scales. I don't think we say, this is the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. I think we figure out the right way to do it. And as I said before, the thing that worries me is that there is going to be this new divide with people who can't stop being connected in some fashion. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think that f hopefully, you know, we will be able to figure this out. We're going to have to figure this out, I think, almost, you know, one by one. I, I, but I think that we are. And by having conversations like this, that's where it starts. And you say what you do, and someone thinks, oh, that's a really good idea. Um, you know? Um, and as a journalist, as someone who writes uh, for a living, um, you know, I hear what you're saying, and then I think, oh, maybe I'll write about that. Mm -hmm. And then more people hear about that. So I think, you know, and, 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 and Jaron's right, we have the internet. Um, and the internet, um, for all of its, you know, uh, problems and faults, is uh, a remarkable megaphone. Mm -hmm. um, so it could be, in a sense, um, its own undoing. And, and you know, I, I want to leave it there. <laughs> like watching the video of this wonderful evening, for example, right? It's going to be on the web for everybody to see. And I, I, totally, I totally agree with you 100%. You know, I, I, in my family, I have five kids. The oldest one works for Google, actually. <laughs> and he's very well paid, and he hates his job, which is very interesting. <laughs> but um, the point being that I, I think... resumes. <laughs> 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 no, but the family, you know, you mentioned the family. Uh -huh. I think that's absolutely important. If, and if you don't have a family, you can always create a space where people are really open no screens, and like what we do in my house, for example, is like every, uh, well, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, we have the philosophy dinners, where you always pose a philosophical question, and a 12 and a seven year old, you know, <laughs> and that's it. And we go, and they all have a voice, right? And we listen to one another. No Wikipedia, no, no cheating, you know, just humans looking at humans in the eye, and I think this is the enlightened resistance, to remember the human condition, how we have a body that feels and touches and is emotional like we all are tonight. And man, there's no machine that can do that. Right. Well, that's that my sounds final word. like the perfect <laughs> place to, to stop. So as all part of the resistance, we should, you know, drop a note with our ideas of how we're going to resist or how <laughs> lives and share those ideas. I think yeah, that's, that's brilliant. It's really yeah. brilliant. Um, thank you all so much. This has been an amazing evening and it's part of our Museum of Science adult programs. We hope that you will come back. If you'd like to get on our mailing list, you can sign up over there. And um, thank you so much for coming and we hope to see you again in the very near future. Good night. <laughs>